David, first and foremost, congratulations on your appointment as Chief Business Officer. What does it mean to you personally to be tasked with leading the football club's off-field operation? Well, it's, the, it's, it's simply the greatest responsibility. For me, as a Sunderland fan, for me as someone who's worked so long in the sports business, to get this opportunity to be at the helm of the business of Sunderland AFC, is, there's, no, there's no better calling. And uh, I'm thrilled to be in the position. I'm really excited about what we can do moving forward. Uh, and um, the potential of this football club is completely limitless. You've been at the football club nine months now. What was it that attracted you to come back home? It was a no-brainer to come back to Sunderland, but there was probably a couple of things that really excited me about coming home. One was working with Christian. I think Christian's done a phenomenal job in his time here. I think what we've seen over the three years, three and a bit years that he's been in charge has been some of the best football that we've seen on Sunderland in, a, in Sunderland in a very, very long time. I think we've got a thriving academy. Uh, I mean, we were just at the end of season awards not so long ago and you just look at how well our academy teams have done and are continuing to do this season. Uh, that's fantastic. You look at some of the young lads that we've got coming through that are representing this club, representing this club in a way that I haven't seen players represent our football club in a long, long time. Shows what it means to the players, but all that work starts at the academy, all that work starts with Christian. So I'm really excited to work with him. Uh, and then honestly, the ownership group, I think Kirill and what he believes in and how he thinks about the business of football, how he thinks about the area. This is clearly an area that's got under his skin. He sees the infinite potential that we have here. Um, and he's not like the, a lot of owners that I've worked with in sports. He's a young guy, he's a progressive guy. Uh, and he's thinking about things in a way which uh, connected me to conversations with him very, very early on. So I think those two things are really important. If we, for, for us to build a complete football club, you've got to have good owners, you've got to have a good sporting side, and you've got to have a good business side. And if those three things are working well, then the football club will be working well. Talk to me about your experiences so far. You've been here nine months, you've been in post, you've got a feel for the place, a really deep and meaningful feel having been in the building. What have you come across and, and where can we build? Well, I think, listen, we've got some really good people at the football club. I think we've got some really talented people on the business side. I think what we've probably lacked a little bit is a sense of purpose of who we are, what makes Sunderland special, uh, the heart and the soul of the football club, and bringing that to life in all of our actions, all, our, all of our interactions with the fans. I think that's probably one area that we haven't been as good as we need to be. I think, listen, it's well documented. I think the idea of us being connected to the fan listening, learning, servicing at a more appropriate level, I think is really, really important for a football club because, listen, on the business side, uh, there's one thing we can't do, and that's impact what happens on the field. But what we can do is create an incredible asset for the fans, a brilliant community asset that connects to the fan base in a way that we all know if we do it right. That sense of belonging between the football club and the fan is really at the core of what makes this football club special. The move back to Sunderland was preceded by 12 years in MLS, an incredible opportunity for you and a time when that league just really went through the roof and took off. That gives you so many experiences to lean on and obviously some of the challenges that you faced, we can embrace those learnings when you're here. Absolutely, you know, our 12 years at MLS, a period of unprecedented growth. I think at some point in the future, that league is gonna be one of the big, big leagues around the world if it's not already knocking on the door. I think what describes that league in my time there was just the potential and how to recognise that potential. I think there's a really close connection at Sunderland there because a very different time scale. We're almost 145 year old as a football club. The potential here is absolutely monumental and it's very much similar to what you know I just left behind in MLS. My experiences were varied uh, because I worked across multiple markets with multiple clubs, with multiple ownership groups. So I saw firsthand different ways to do it, to think about how they ultimately connect to a fan, how they think about an audience, how they commercialize that, how they offer different and unique products and experiences. One of the things the American market is very, very good at is innovating and pushing forward. Uh, they're not held back by tradition and heritage in the way that you know we have a lot of tradition and heritage in this country. So they're able to think a little bit differently. I'm gonna bring that to this football club. We're gonna think differently. We're gonna push the boundaries of what's possible. Uh, and that's what I think is, is really exciting about the platform that we're, uh, that we're building at this football club. That alludes to what Kirill said to supporters a couple of months ago in terms of the way we want to connect with fans moving forward, the way we want to put fans at the heart of our decision making. 
when we talk about fan centricity to the to the to the normal fan to the normal match goer, what does that mean to them? Well, it means really a recommitment to the fan. It really means putting them at the heart at the heart of all decision making. So when we're in Black Hat House or wherever we might be in the business, the fan is always, always, always front and centre. It should. It, it, it sounds like this is a no-brainer, but the reality is in football clubs, you know, sometimes you lose sight of this a little bit. But we have to hit reset. We have to put the fan at the core of everything we do moving forward. We need to listen. We need to learn. And we need to build our actions around that moving forward. Fast forward 12 months. What does progress, what does success look like for you in your role and for obviously the business operation as well? Yeah, listen, I think we, under, make no bones about it, we've got a lot of work to do. We've got a lot of work to do. I think we've made a lot of progress in the last three years. I think um, the owner's been clearly very focused and he's been on record talking about this. He's been very focused on getting the football side right given where we were on the pitch. And I think, you know, we've, we've seen what's happened over the three years there. I think we've made some progress on the business side, but it's really time to c- kind of push forward with 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 a lot of those things I've already mentioned. You know, thinking about how we think about the fan, building around the fan, thinking of, of our commercial models differently, moving projects through. You know, at a, at a faster rate. So we look at all the work that's going to go on this summer around the stadium, um, inside the stadium, which is going to really increase and improve the fan experience. And some engagement opportunities we've got there will feel very different at the stadium light as we start next season, which we're really thrilled about. The surrounding areas with the ticketing inquiries, service centre, um, the new retail store that we already mentioned. But I think really at the core of it all is this, is this uh, reinvigoration around the football club, around who are we, the heart and soul of, of Sunderland, because you know if we do it right, no one can no one can match us. I think you said you'd be disowned if you didn't support Sunderland. Um, talk to me about your early experiences with the club, whether that be a fan or, as many people may not know, as a player. Yeah, it's pretty multifaceted, to be fair, and uh, one I'm really, really proud of, and, and I think puts me in an interesting position to now be heading up the business. So, like many fans, started going to games with with, with my father. Uh, remember the walk to the stadium, getting the program, collecting the programs, you know, getting a bovril or a or, or a pie at half time being freeze, f- frozen cold. Uh, first season was the Dennis Smith uh, season in Division 3. So certainly started at a, at a fairly low ebb. Uh, saw a promotion year, so it was a really, really good year as a, as a, as a first-time fan to see. Um, early heroes, you know, people like Tony Norman because I ended up being a goalkeeper. I was actually the very, my mother reminds me of this all the time, but I was the first member of the Rogarugis. Uh, my mum my has a card in the house, 001. So, um, men's point of pride that I was the first member of the Rogarukis. Um I then was very blessed to get uh, invited to uh, the Sunderland Centre of Excellence as it was uh, called at the time which would be an equivalent to the academy now so I was one of the young goalkeepers I was a goalkeeper uh, although my stature might not suggest I, I would be very good but uh, I was a goalkeeper as a kid and was at Sunderland Centre of Excellence from the age of about 10 to 16 um, brilliant experience uh, as a kid, all I dreamt about was playing for Sunderland. Uh, all I dreamt about was being like my hero at the time, Tony Norman. Um, and my mother actually uh, was also employed by Sir Bob. Uh, we ran the what was called the Youth Hostel at the time, which was a facility on the seafront in Sunderland, which looked after all the YTS players at Sunderland at that particular time. So my mum, my dad, uh, my brother and I, we lived in this house surrounded by lads who'd signed YTS contracts for Sunderland. I mean, imagine that. You want to play for Sunderland, a 10, 11 year old kid, and your mom's job and your dad's job is to look after these 15 to 20 uh, kids who are between the ages of 16 and 19, who all they want to do is become a professional at Sunderland. They've already signed a YTS at that point. So it was an amazing, amazing uh, exposure to the inner workings of the football club, the dreams and desires of, of, of young lads who want to become professionals. And, um, you know, a, a, a brilliant time for my brother and I. My brother actually became a professional for, for a period of time at, at West Brom. But um, during that time, I got to know some Sunday legends so well. So George Hurd and uh, Jimmy Monty and Kevin Ball were frequent visitors to the house because my mum at that time made all the sandwiches for the training ground and she made the pre-match meals 
uh, and Jimmy and George were involved with the youth team and the reserve team. And Jimmy actually was my goalkeeper coach as well, which, I mean, imagine that as a kid. You've got, like, the Sunderland legend as your coach. Uh, you can't actually ask for more than that. So Jimmy would always, even on a night, he'd come in for his team. My mum would be making the pre-match meal for the reserve game. And he'd come and find me, and he'd be go, he'd be go sit down on the floor, get down on the floor. I'd be like, what are you doing? He's like, I bet you can't jump up quicker than me. I went, what do you mean? He went, well, when you, you're a goalkeeper, you parry, you save, you've got to get up. And, and listen, this is a guy who's probably made one of the greatest saves in the history of the game based on parrying a ball and jumping up faster than anyone. So he'd literally put me on the floor, he'd get on the floor and go, right, let's see if you, see if you can get up the quickest. Could never get up quicker than Jimmy. Could never get up quicker than Jimmy. So it goes to show even then he still had it in him. So it was an amazing upbringing. The club is in me, it's in my blood. Uh, even though I've been out the region for 20 or so years at this point, it's never left me. And anyone who I met along the way, I would always talk about this wonderful football club in the northeast of England called Sunderland. So for me to be back now at the helm of the business is a complete, a complete honour.